heavy. And is can we have a stationary table? Can we have a table that John? Nobody answers. Can in we get this a business? Table Kate Hepburn. Call me Kate. That's all right. Don't be so formal. <laughs> This, that, might be this is a little solider. Move out. Move it out. Just put this out here. I have a card. I've been in the business so long. No one ever dreamed of getting Katherine Hepburn on a talk show. I got word to her, and the word came back, I have a quick answer for that. Everyone knew what the answer was. Yes, that's better. That's all right. That's great. Yeah. Miss Hepburn, because she feared doing it, made herself do it. If anybody can survive that carpet, <laughs> whose idea was that? The minute she steps on a stage or comes on a screen or enters the room that you happen to be in, it's as if music plays. Bang! Cold sober, I find myself absolutely fascinating. <laughs> I think it was being born at the right year for my personality. You know, the pants came in, the low heels came in, the terrible woman came in who spoke her mind. I, I was born absolutely at the right time. That's the story of me. Great timing. Catherine Hepburn is regarded as the greatest female star in the history of American cinema. Her over 60 years of acting have been applauded on many occasions, and her record-breaking four Oscars for Best Leading Actress confirm that she had something special, something that only great stars have. But what is it? The characters that she helped create were so multi-layered. That's why her career sustained for such a long time because she could be so funny. She, she, she was a great leading woman because she gave her leading men shit. Because she challenged every single leading man that she had. Don't you want your rub down? You want a drink? Want anything? What? <laughs> what a star has to sell is their persona. And Hepburn had the ability to dig in her heels without pissing people off to the extent that they would not hire her again. And, you know, she delivered on screen. Um, she was always interesting, even in films that were not always as good as you might hope they would be. I remember one time all of us were going to her house for uh, between matinee and evening, and she had made some shrimp thing. I don't know. What it was. Anyway, they were the car was full of us. She got in the trunk, sat in the trunk of the car when we drove over there. Okay, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Crazy woman. <laughs> Miss Hepburn, she's a champ. I mean it. The champion lady golfer. Watch this. I don't think anybody knows what the so-called it is. You know it when you see it. You see that face, those features, and that 
burning personality that's coming out of it. I don't want to be worshipped. I, I want to be loved. I was lucky enough to have been born at a time when they wanted this, me, my, whatever it is. I've got it. <laughs> but, I mean, what is it? I don't think it's talent. I think it's just, uh, you've got a good hot motor inside you, and it ticks away, and your eyes shine, and your teeth shine. Hello, Dexter. Hello, George. Hello, Mike. <laughs> Deborah Nadorman Landis is professor for costume design at UCLA in Los Angeles and an insider in the Hollywood film business. She created the look of Spielberg's Indiana Jones as well as the iconic leather jacket for Michael Jackson's thriller video. Is she someone who was ever going to be a flash in the pan? No. She was a star in the 30s, she was a star in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, and in the 80s. She maintained her career and she transitioned so magnificently through her 60-year career. And the audience just kept wanting to see her and kept showing up to see who she would be next. Catherine Hepburn is the second eldest child of very progressive parents. And together with her five brothers and sisters, Catherine enjoys an easygoing and liberal upbringing in their family home Fenwick in New England. Early photographs of Kathy and her two-year-older brother Tom show two very similar young kids. They form a close relationship within the family. Later, they are followed by brothers Dick and Bob and the younger sisters Marion and Peg. Mr. and Mrs. Hepburn encourage their children to be self-confident and free from fear. They are allowed to speak their mind and given space to realize their own dreams, but under one condition. Everything in life must be earned by hard work. Competition plays an important role within the family. Her upbringing inspires her for the rest of her life. The closeness of the family is embodied by their family home in Fenwick, Old Saybrook. The Hepburn motto, listen to the song of life, is carved into the stone fireplace. The house is Catherine's lifelong hideaway. She described it as her private paradise. Whenever the work allowed, here on the Connecticut coast, she could just relax and be herself. I was brought up in a big family and I was brought up great. Just uh, brought up great. I had a fascinating nice. mother, a fascinating father, and a wonderful childhood. How I really did. And I have a wonderful family now, and I have my roots in the same place that I was brought up, and I'm e extraordinarily lucky, you uh, know, and that's just luck. In my family, Kate was the hero. She was the one who we all admired and looked up to. Mundy Hepburn is Catherine's favorite nephew and the son of her younger brother, Dick. He grew up in the house in Fenwick with Auntie Catherine. He still lives in Old Saybrook and is an artist who works with glass. Kate's mother was an orphan and taken care of by rich relatives and got an attitude of, you and your money, the hell with you. You want to be mean to me? I know who you are. You're an old bastard. That's who you are. And she begged to go to Bryn Mawr. I want to go to college. And the answer was, women don't go to college. Good God, go marry someone rich. And she thought, forget it, not a chance. So there was a sort of original thought on Kate's mother's uh, part, born of suffering, think it out for yourself, figure out what's real for yourself. Catherine Martha Houghton, saw a man 
diving into a swimming pool and said, I'm gonna marry him. And that man was Tom Hepburn. They married, went to Hartford. He being a urologist started a practice and being a urologist, he got the venereal disease cases from the hospital. And the rich society women would come in, doctor, there's something wrong with me and I can't imagine what's wrong. Madam, you have gonorrhea. I, I do not. Madam, you have gonorrhea. And a bunch of these ladies would come in and it was learned after a while that their husbands were visiting the local whorehouse and catching gonorrhea from the whores and bringing it home to their lovely wives. And my grandmother, learning this from her husband, was enraged. Now this was around the time of women's rights and suffragettes and all that stuff. She got a soapbox, my father told me this. She went to Elizabeth Park and said, do you realize what's going on in your town? and talked and people, ah, shut up. And they threw things at her. And she would come home with a dirty dress and go out in a few days and do it again. And finally it was like, oh, those terrible, horrible Hepburns. Don't go near them. They're, oh, spreading rumors and gossip. Oh, how could they? And finally, she did it for long enough where people would be like, what did she say? For real? Ooh. The whorehouse was closed. The ladies stopped getting gonorrhea. And uh, they became <laughs> absolutely reviled in their community. And she helped get the woman's vote. And she stood up for human rights, that is woman's rights, children's rights, and what is right, not what is correct, not what's politically correct or proper, but what is actually good for human society. And so Kate grew up during this time and thought, my God, these people are crazy, but I like it. Would you consider yourself <laughs> a feminist? I, yes, I'm an absolute feminist. You were quite a tomboy as a, as a young girl, weren't you? You were called Jimmy. I, I was called Jimmy and I hated being a girl. I really hated it. I just shaved my head and thought, I'm a boy. What did your parents think of this? They thought it was great. They didn't have to brush my hair or wash it. <laughs> In 1921, the family harmony is crushed by an unexpected tragedy. It casts a dark shadow over Catherine and haunts her for the rest of her life. Kathy and Tom decide to visit an aunt in New York. There's no sign of anything wrong. Tom tells his aunt that the trip is one of the best experiences he's ever had. They go to the theater, and the following morning, Catherine discovers her brother hanging from the attic ceiling. Dr. Hepburn tries to talk himself and the newspapers into thinking it's just an accident, simply a foolish prank. The death of her adored brother at just 16 remains the trauma of her life. She adopts his birthday as hers and makes herself two years older. My father remembered an image of my granddaddy sitting there with his head in his hands going, why did he do it? Why? Why did he do it? The family never speaks about the loss of Tom again. The past is the past. Kathy becomes moody after Tom's death and her parents take her out of school. She's given private lessons which are perfect for Catherine. She develops a passion for golf and even reaches the semi-final of the Young Women's Golf Championship in Connecticut. But one of the few other things that really lift her spirits is acting in backyard productions. Thanks to intensive private teaching, Catherine is able to enroll at college at 17. Like her mother, she attends Bryn Mawr, an elite women's college near Philadelphia. Monday, September 29th, 1924, is her first day. She was not a regular girl. She was a high-class Bryn Mawr girl. 
and Bryn Mawr, and still is, one of the greatest colleges in this, in the United States, probably in the world, only for really smart girls. From all over the United States, and from foreign countries too, young women who have completed their high school education enter Bryn Mawr for a four-year course in liberal arts. Kate, as she now calls herself, makes an extraordinary first impression at the college. The first evening, she enters the dining hall trying to conceal her terror of the other girls. The tables of students fall silent. All are staring at her. Suddenly, a voice quips, ah, self-conscious beauty. Everyone laughs. Kate runs out. I nearly dropped dead, she writes in her autobiography. She avoids the dining room for a month and always goes to bed early to study. Her time at Bryn Mawr was very formative for Kate, but not only in an academic sense. In her second year, Kate becomes more confident and joins the theatre group to act in The Truth About Blades, where she plays the leading man in wig and trousers. To celebrate the good reviews of her first appearance, Kate starts amusing herself outside of college. She goes out dressed as a man, and one evening she strips off and jumps naked into the cloister pond. Smoking and boys are in. One of her first flirts and admirers is Ludlow Ogden Smith, nicknamed Luddy. Kate poses in front of his camera, sometimes nude. But that's all there was to it, she soberly writes later in her autobiography about future husband Luddy. Catherine Hepburn graduated in history and philosophy at Bryn Mawr in 1928. Her acting at Bryn Mawr is crowned by her role as Pandora in the Grand May Day celebration in 1928. Whoever filmed the parade that day managed to capture Catherine Hepburn acting for the very first time on celluloid. Kate's father can see that day are the soles of her dirty feet getting blacker and blacker and her freckled face getting redder and redder. Dr. Hepburn remains skeptical about the whole acting business. For him, the profession is just one step away from walking the streets. But Kate has already made up her mind. Sparked by the applause of the audiences at Bryn Mawr, she knows she has to become an actress. He just thought if you go into the theater for a woman, it was a profession for her that would last about five years. Mine's lasted 52 so far, so I'm okay. <laughs> Daddy was wrong. Kate stays loyal to the school and visits the campus several times to talk to lecturers and students. The Catherine Horton Hepburn Center is founded in 2006 to honor the adventurous and bold spirit of the Horton Hepburn women and to inspire future generations of women to challenge conventions just as Catherine and her mother have done. Catherine's next step is to join small touring theatre companies. She plays her first leading role at Ivoryton Playhouse, not far from Fenwick, in the summer of 1931. She is 24. Then everything starts happening fast. Catherine manages to reach the dream of almost every struggling actor. She lands a job on Broadway. But instead of acting, Kate is acting up. Under pressure, her voice gets too high and she speaks too quickly. Hepburn is bad. Hepburn is inept. 
She needs a lot of practice. I never studied acting. <laughs> well, I studied with quite a number of people. I studied with Francis Robinson Dove yeah. in New York. I studied voice, and you used to blow a candle out, so you'd have the and feel her diaphragm go in. And I never understood a word of it. I'd blow, and I was so excited, I'd blow from here, yeah. and I'd lose my voice every time I played, because I was petrified. What's the second part? See. Catherine Hepburn always loved facing a challenge, as Dick Cavett well knows. Dick Cavett is an actor who was a talk show host for 30 years. From 1968 on, he interviewed some of the greatest stars in the world on his celebrated Dick Cavett show. In 1973, he succeeds in getting Catherine Hepburn in front of television cameras for the very first time. Kate is 68. I've never been able to totally satisfy myself on why she finally decided to do it. I think she became aware that it was a current thing to do for many people in the business. And I think she liked the challenge. Kate only wants to deliver the best and loves being provocative. Despite initial difficulties, theater producers quickly notice she has charisma, all the makings of a star. She embodies the zeitgeist. I got fired, but, but then sometimes I'd get taken back, and sometimes I'd get good reviews, and sometimes, not terribly interesting, I think I irritated people. Maybe I still do. Since college, Luddy is at Kate's side, and follows her to New York to become a stockbroker. Luddy is a sensitive, loyal, and good-natured friend. After the first flops on Broadway, he seizes the opportunity. Kate and Luddy shock the theater company with the sudden news that Kate is giving up her career to marry him. Their marriage lasts six years. They move into a modest house in Turtle Bay Gardens, New York, in 1933. It becomes Catherine Hepburn's home for more than 60 years and one of the stable pillars which Catherine's life and career rests on. However, the enthusiasm about being a married lady only lasts for a few weeks. Kate returns to the theater. She makes Luddy change his name because she does not want to be called Mrs. Smith. She says later, I wasn't fit to be married because I only thought about myself. Whatever Kate wants is fine for Luddy. She's working hard on herself and isn't discouraged by constantly being fired from shows. Anyone else would have given up, but in 1932, she's suddenly cast in The Warrior's Husband. The play is a racy satire set in 800 BC. An overbearing tribe of Amazon women rule their men with an iron fist, the perfect role for Kate. Kate feels like a real actress for the first time. She embodies the perfect Art Deco look, her angular beauty reflecting the ideal of art and design of the time, progressive and futuristic. Hepburn plays the overbearing Amazon warrior Antiope in a turquoise swimsuit, metallic armor, and bronzed arms, legs, and face. She springs feistily onto stage, a stag swinging over her shoulder. The audiences go wild, and so does Hollywood. She's offered a screen test for RKO Studios. All her dramatic energy is invested in it, a militant beginning. Kate knows she wants to be a success. Kate describes her arrival in Hollywood in her autobiography. She tells of her tough dealings with agents and studio bosses. She quickly learns her role within the Hollywood movie-making system and turns it to her own advantage. Her very first film is a box office hit. Don't. You see, you can't stand even the first glimpse of the truth. Darling, 
It would be dangerous for me to marry. There was this fascinating new experience, the film, the medium, you know, this whole new industry, this new experience of people seeing. Imagine putting your face on a huge screen, 12 feet tall, and it's a new thing in the world. And whatever you say, people are going to dream on. And she picked up on this and worked it. It was cool. Robert S. Burchard is an award-winning film editor, writer, and noted film historian at the American Film Institute in Los Angeles. Katherine Hepburn came to films in the early 1930s just as sound was fully taking hold. And in the silent era, the stars had been very visually iconic. And there was a carryover with that visual appeal in the early 30s. Many of the stars have that same kind of glamour aspect to them, but sound added another dimension. And some of the stars that had been very popular in the silent era didn't maintain that popularity in the sound era because, not because they were bad actors or any lesser than they had been earlier, but their voices didn't project that same kind of iconic uh, uh, aspect that their visual personas had. Uh, Catherine Hepburn was one of those uh, actors in the early 30s who, uh, like a Jimmy Cagney or a Mae West, who had a vocal quality that matched her uh, screen image and projected that a total persona for, for audiences. The 1920s and 30s are times driven by style and attitude. Anything fresh, fast, and rebellious is intriguing. Hollywood's success is based on the creation of dreams. Katherine Hepburn's silver screen charisma promises something very unique. Girls from the wrong side of the tracks find happiness with a man from the right side? If you want our summer evenings to be over, you'll have to drive me away yourself. No one else can. No one. Well, I won't. See for yourself with Academy Award winner Katherine Hepburn. She has the tough fragile about her. She, she was um, absolutely beautiful, but was she a sex object? I don't think so. There were three women in the golden age of Hollywood who were really known for wearing trousers in their own lives. Greta Garbo and Marlena Dietrich. Can I just say, the great Greta Garbo, the great Marlena Dietrich, and the great Katharine Hepburn. And each of these women were able to transform on screen into go goddesses, glamorous goddesses. Lucky for me, you're not the sort of girl that likes to make a man play the fool. <laughs> Perhaps I played the fool myself in choosing to live such a lonely life. Christopher Strong is completely androgynous. It's just totally gender bending. And she does wear this metal chain, silver chain mail suit. And yet works it and makes it, it, it becomes, it's, it's not a costume. Look. Catherine Hepburn was such a great actress that clothes became, were, a second skin to her. She literally filled that new person. She, she was born new every time. She brought part of her personality to each and every one of her characters, and yet she was different in each and every role. Your eyes are as soft, your hair is pleasant to my touch. No, I cannot see this change, and I, I do not wish a change. It is within me, but it is so great I thought it must show in my face. On the strength of her first film, A Bill of Divorcement, directed by George Cukor, RKO signs the actress to a long-term contract. Catherine is now the property of the studio, and many aspects of her life are also under control. 
the Hollywood publicity machinery gets rolling. A devoted fan scrapbook lying untouched for decades in the New York Public Library reveals the Hollywood star system strategy in headlines and articles. Studio bosses are trying to mold Catherine into a Garbo-like figure. But Catherine is neither exotic or mysterious. I think when you have a unique personality, as she did, it's a little unnerving to come across that in, you know, for the first time. It's, uh, uh, she was unlike anybody else, and whether she was good or bad in those early roles is not really, it's hard to know, but we, we know that she was unique, and film audiences had trouble relating to her screen image. In Hollywood's City of Dreams, Business is not only about creating celluloid images, it's about making money. Catherine Hepburn obviously understands this from the very beginning and fearlessly commands an outlandish salary of $1,500 a week. The studio knows she's worth it. She'll bring the money rolling in. The international capital of the motion picture is fabulously press agent and suburb of Los Angeles. Hollywood, a community whose name alone is a magic word throughout the world. During the golden age of Hollywood, everything is controlled by five major studios. In the 1930s, these homes of movie magic produce hundreds of films a year. They invest enormous sums of money recruiting and grooming talented actors in order to control them with long-term contracts. The star system creates legends in order to create money. Many actors are just small fry in the system, but Catherine knows exactly how the dream-making machinery works. Everyone is curious about Hepburn. Fans, photographers and newspapers overwhelm her with attention. It is stressed how much she hates publicity. But then she cheekily shows off with a monkey perched on her shoulder. Her private life is kept a secret, but rumors are already circulating about those trousers and her women companions. At a time when marriage and motherhood are seen as the ultimate goals for women, she sees neither as being right for her. One day, Catherine wears dungarees on set. Studio executives think she's pushing things too far and take them away. She simply strips off and walks around half naked until she gets them back. The stage and screen are just ways of becoming a star. Only later, Kate begins to take her acting seriously. What's with all this fame stuff? And she said, yes, isn't it the damnedest? <laughs> I'd be like, why do people do that, make you all famous and stuff? And she said, I don't know. People like to look up. After six months in Hollywood and just two films, Katherine Hepburn does something unusual for a woman in Hollywood at the time. She gets involved in the production process. At 26, she reads the script for Morning Glory and thinks, it must have been written for me. A girl from New England goes to New York to become an actress has a couple of lovers and becomes a star overnight. She wins her first Oscar, beginner's luck. She was so sure of not winning that she goes to Europe. This is the first of her famous non-appearances at the Academy Awards. In less than a year, she's become more than a Hollywood leading lady. She is now a star. Your most challenging role, is there one that sticks out in your mind? As I don't think so. I, you know, I think I played them all the same way, didn't I? That's what they tell me. <laughs> you don't believe that, do you? <laughs> yes, I do. I think most people do. Some people are very good character actors. I'm not. You just have, you have to be sure that you're well cast. If you really want Bessie, please wait until Mommy comes home. But, oh, God. Please. No, we, we never can be boy and girl again, Laurie. 
Those happy old times can't come back. And we shouldn't expect them to. Catherine is perfectly cast in Little Women, and by the autumn of 1933, the film is breaking all box office records. There's nothing standing in her way anymore. As though it's part and parcel of the business, Catherine has a few affairs, including a legendary one with Howard Hughes, the millionaire and aviator. But this isn't the reason she eventually decides to divorce Luddy. The work of an actress and the life of a housewife are absolutely incompatible for Catherine Hepburn. In 1934, after six years of marriage, they're divorced in Mexico. These are the golden years of Hollywood, and Catherine Hepburn embodies them. Although the studio regards her as one of its most valuable properties, the appealing mix of comedy and pathos in her first films is being neglected. She is being cast in melodramatic parts as a serious actress. Catherine lacks the traditional feminine appeal of the sweet 1930s girl, and her next four films are box office flops. The audiences just don't want to see Catherine Hepburn anymore, at least not like that. Catherine Hepburn's star seems to have suddenly burnt out. The studio begins to talk about the Hepburn stigma. The financial flops at the box office are increasing. Catherine's downfall seems to be unstoppable. When independent cinema owners issue a list of actors declared as box office poison, Greta Garbo, Malena Dietrich and Catherine Hepburn are amongst them. Not only the films are unpopular, problems arise from Hepburn's attitude. She refuses interviews and turns down requests for autographs, which earn her the nickname Catherine of Arrogance. She simply refuses to behave like other Hollywood celebrities. It looks as if her movie career, which began so brilliantly just six years before, is now over. My pictures were bores. I mean, Woman Rebels was a bore. Break of Hearts was a bore. Quality Street was a bore. And I sort of smelled it before I made them, but I was on a salary where they had to pay me, and I thought I should do them. I've never thought that the Golden Age was a moment in time that was any different than now, that, um, that somehow it was more glamorous then, or somehow they had a different point of view. They didn't. All they wanted to do was make money from their films. How do you make money from a movie? You make money from a movie if people love it. Love it. You have to love the movie. How do you love a movie? You love a movie when you're swept away and you forget your life and you're in the film and you have left everything behind and you're on a journey. That's when a movie transcends um, storytelling and becomes iconography. And dark clouds are not only gathering over Hollywood. September 1938, the eastern seaboard is lashed by a tropical hurricane. For two days, the coast from New Jersey to New England felt its full fury. A hurricane sweeps along the coast of Connecticut, completely destroying her beloved family home in Fenwick. A double catastrophe for Catherine. No home, no film career. The house was devastated in the hurricane, as most of Old Saybrook was. Um, it was. It was just the cottages along the shoreline were taken right off their foundations and toppled over and landed up in the wetlands. And um, she was very distressed about her house being missed. But somebody came down, and they were taking pictures of the damage, and here was Catherine sitting in the bathtub, which was still upright, all by itself with no walls around it. <laughs> and Catherine loved it so much that she just wanted that rebuilt, and she took it upon herself to rebuild the house in the same place, and she lived the rest of her days down there. Whenever she could get back from Hollywood, she would be down there. Out of the blue, the dramatist Philip Barry arrives at Fenwick to offer Catherine a play he's written especially for her. Each line is tailored to her personality and sets the tone for most of the roles to follow. The independent, outspoken woman far brighter than the men around her, a perfect vehicle for her return to Broadway. It's called The Philadelphia Story. From 1939, the show runs for more than 400 performances, 
The critics and audiences are ecstatic. Catherine Hepburn is back. Every time they show a montage of scenes or from famous movies, almost invariably it will include Cary Grant walking out of the house, Hepburn behind him, breaking his golf club, his walking back, pushing her in the face, and she falls like a tree fast to the ground. And I asked her, not on the show, I think, um, how did you do that fall? You don't put your hand down, you know, it seems like you go straight out of frame, but on your back. And she said, I don't remember that. I said, the scene with Kerry, she didn't remember it. Must be wonderful to have made so many films that you can forget being pushed by Cary Grant. <laughs> And the night that you got drunk on champagne and climbed out on the roof and stood there naked with your arms out to the moon, wailing like a banshee. I told you I never had the slightest recollection of doing any such thing. What in the name of all that's holy am I to do? Tracy. Yes, Mike. Old Parson Parson, he's never seen Kidbridge before, has he? Now look, I got you into this thing and I'll get you out of it. Will you marry me, Tracy? Hepburn steers her own comeback when she buys the film rights to the Philadelphia story, which Kate then sells to MGM under the condition that she plays the leading role. She was the leading man's equal. She couldn't be manipulated. She always had the comeback word. She was uh, a smart cookie. She was a woman's woman. She was smart, and yet she made us care about her. So she wasn't so tough that she couldn't get hurt. She could have her heart broken. In each of her performances, she works on so many different levels, the heart and the head. Now, Katherine Hepburn is playing Hollywood's game by her own rules. At a time when few stars and even fewer women could escape the grip of the studios, she discovers she can stand up to powerful movie executives and win. Katherine is back in business. Catherine Hepburn wants only the very top stars to play with her in the Philadelphia story. Instead of James Stewart and Cary Grant, she really wants the leading men of the time, Clark Gable and Spencer Tracy. Spencer Tracy is the major MGM star with 20 years experience in the film business. Man is not truly one, but two. Now, supposing we could break that chain, separate those two selves, free the good in man and let it go on to its higher destiny, and segregate the bad. Let it destroy itself in its own degradation. Performances in films like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and Father of the Bride secure his reputation as one of the greatest character actors of the 20th century. I always used to think that marriages were simple affairs. Boy meets girl. Fall in love, they get married, have babies. Eventually, the babies grow up and meet other babies. And they fall in love, and get married, and have babies, and so on and on. Tracy has 73 films and two Oscars behind him. He looks rough and ready, a tough guy, very masculine. This seems exactly what attracts Catherine to him. Catherine Hepburn is Tess, the highbrow political writer. She may have been the woman of the year, but she didn't win it with her cooking. Woman of the Year is the first of nine Tracy Hepburn films and sets the working pattern for the successful duo. When they meet, Catherine is 33, Spencer 40. They are perfect casting for comedies about relationships. Yeah, that was one of the, the you can't avoid the phrase chemistry in talking about whatever it was that between the two of them was perfect. Something intimate between husband and wife. What would you think about having a child? Tess! Tess, is that what all this build-up has been for? Did you think I'd have to be sold on the idea? Well, I wasn't quite sure. I thought perhaps I'd better get you into the right frame of mind. Get me into the right... Me? Well, the sooner the better. 
It's already been done. It's already been... It seems like a harmless flirt at first. Spencer is renowned for his affairs with co-stars, and Catherine is divorced. But this is much more than just an affair. Spencer and Catherine remain together for 27 years, until his death. It's a kind of soul relationship, but Tracy is leading a double life. He's too Catholic to divorce from his wife Louise, with whom he has two children. Spencer suffers with a constant bad conscience, mostly drunk and alone in the Beverly Hills Hotel. In their films together, Tracy plays the dominant masculine man, Hepburn, his submissive wife. They represent the kind of romantic idealism of the time. Hepburn embodies this role perfectly, but is fully aware that she is only acting it on screen. And indeed, Spencer Tracy is the only man she ever looks up to. Well, Spencer Tracy, I think, was like an everyday Joe, you know, somebody you'd meet on the street. Uh, he didn't have actorly mannerisms. He didn't um, have a particularly cultured voice. Hepburn had a very distinctive regional accent, at least for this country. He came in, hit his marks, read his lines. As he often said, you know, you go through the goddamn door because there's no other way to get into the goddamn room. He sort of reveled in that non-actory persona. Uh, maybe that's what made them a, a item off screen, is that they were opposites that were attracted. I stood looking at the bridge. I said to myself quite calmly, he'll come this way and be killed unless you hurry and warn him. I only care that you won't let me help you. I'm in love with you. Don't you understand that? You can't do this to me. Hepburn had a reputation for being kind of snooty in her early uh, years and, and aloof. Perhaps Spencer Tracy brought her down to earth, uh, as he did on screen so many times, and, and I think that that may have been part of the appeal of their relationship. Adam! What? Don't you dare slam that door! All right. I don't see them as the all-American couple. And I, you know what, she's not, she's not the all-American anything. You know what the relationship is very close to? Much more like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Fred was the class and Ginger was the ass. Uh, that, he, that without her, he was so stiff and she warmed him up. I think she was fiercely loyal. She was in two words impossible. I remember Cagney said to me once, he said, you know, none of us could control her. She would come in and break up a card game. I'd be playing with Frank McHugh and Spencer, and Hepburn would come in, and she'd just disrupt the whole game, just this. And, and he said, but Spencer would say to her, Red, sit down and shut up, and she would. I'm old-fashioned. I like two sexes. And what is more, I suddenly don't like being married to what is known as a new woman. I want a wife, not a competitor. Competitor, competitor. If you want to be a big he woman, go and be one, but not with me. What attracted me to Spencer Tracy is uh, what? Magic. He was a witty, amusing, entertaining man with a rather difficult nature. I mean, it was easy for me to please Spencer because I loved him. Perhaps their relationship functions so well because they never lived together as husband and wife. Catherine remains independent. 
In their years together, she makes just as many films without him. She even returns to the theater with Shakespeare. In 1949, they took the As You Like It tour around the country, and they kept a bucket, a waste basket, right near stage entry. And Kate would go up and throw up into the bucket, totally nervous, just completely freaked out and afraid, and go on stage anyway. And as my mother said, give a brilliant performance, and then come back and grab my mother by the shoulders. Was I any good? Was I any good? And, and my mother said, and she meant it. Was I any good? This is how badly, this is how hard she tried. This is how badly she wanted to succeed and do a good job. That's what was interesting about her. She, she was afraid, she doubted herself, she did it anyway. The thing about her nature that's natural is an enormously centered ego, uh, a very centered um, drive. So if you're going to do something, do it all the way. Don't do it halfway. Either do it or don't do it. So if you're going to do it, and if you have to throw up, then throw up. But do it. Because I hate the feeling of being kind of ha doing half as well as I can do. I love I mean, perfection is thrilling. She was rough on her, the cast of people that were working with her, but no rougher on them than she was on herself because she felt that if people, whether it was a movie or, or plays as she did here or Broadway, uh, people were willing to pay good money to see them perform. They owed it to the audience to do their very best I don't think money was her main consideration. I think she wanted to play parts that she felt she could really play well, and when she decided to play a part, she made up her mind to do everything she possibly could to make that part perfect. For a long time, I was too egotistical, I suppose, and too frightened to accept the fact that the audience, after all these years, had given me there's an, they'd given me their friendship, mm -hmm. their undiluted, just friendship. We like you. You're nice. Kate thought so much about her position relative to her audience. Who am I to you is the question that interested her. And so she thought, well, who are you to me? And who am I to you? So she studies this and learns and watches others and really thinks about it on a very personal level. And I think the thing about a movie camera is that I can be right here inside of your head. I can be next to you and we can dream together. So any dream that I dream, you can be dragged into. And if it's a good dream, then both of us will be nourished and helped. And that can be a wonderful, powerful experience. All my old girlfriends loved Katherine Hepburn. <laughs> Many people have been inspired by her, her way. By the early 1950s, Katherine Hepburn is at the height of her career. She's an internationally famous dramatic actress with a flair for comedy and is a rock-solid box office attraction. But she's looking for new challenges, and in 1951, she goes on location to shoot The African Queen with Humphrey Bogart and director John Huston. An authentic experience it is too. Crocodiles in the river, poisonous snakes in the portable toilet, and diarrhea. Catherine later reflects on the shoot in her book, The Making of the African Queen, or How I Went to Africa with Bogard, Bacall and Houston and Almost Lost My Mind. Catherine is tough as the prudish Rosie Sayer, 
a role which is probably the one most responsible for branding Hepburn's screen image into our cinematic memory. You promised you'd go down the river. There's death a dozen times over down the river. You promised. Well, I'm taking my promise back. I never dreamed that any experience could be so stimulating. I think as she moved into middle age, she was fortunate to have a couple of roles, the, the so-called spinster roles that um, uh, also projected strength and individuality, African Queen and Summertime come to mind, where she was not just an irrelevant old biddy who was sitting on the porch rocking in the rocking chair. She was out there trying to get things done. And again, I think this was a, a matter of self-awareness and of her own persona, I think, in, in, in you know, pushing ahead to, to get what she wanted and what she needed in her life. At the beginning of the 1960s, Spencer Tracy's health, damaged by a lifetime of heavy drinking, begins to deteriorate so rapidly that he's taken to the clinic. Hepburn, always at his side, becomes his dedicated nurse. She takes appropriate steps by keeping fit with sport, drinking less and stopping smoking. Out of respect for his wife, Louise Tracy, Catherine always keeps herself in the background. Their relationship is a well-kept secret and they very rarely appear together in public. Even the sharp-tongued Hollywood gossip columns respect them. She certainly took care of him, and it was a nurse-patient relationship a lot of the time, yeah. There's a... You, always, you often run across the thing of someone finding her sleeping outside his hotel room door at, I think, the Beverly Hills Hotel, where he was drunk inside and uh, rolling about. Tortured man. She was good for him, apparently, and saved him any number of times. In 1967, a time when racial tension is still rife in the USA, the film Guess Who's Coming to Dinner tells the story of a family whose daughter, played by Kate's niece, Katherine Horton, wants to marry her black boyfriend. John Wade Prentice. Isn't that a lovely name? John Wade. Joanna Prentice, I'll be. They met in Hawaii, black man, white woman, about the same time that Obama's parents met in Hawaii. And there is a scene between uh, uh, Poitier and Tracy, which Tracy says, do you realize your, your children, your mixed marriage, your children are going to have big problems? And his response is, we know there may be problems, but your daughter, Catherine Houghton, believes that one of our children may go up to be president someday. This was 1967, 30 years or more before anybody ever heard of Barack Obama, which I think is amazing. Until today, I would never have believed that I could say such a thing. But when she fights you, I'm going to be on her side. It's their final film together, and also the last film to star Spencer Tracy. Just two weeks after shooting finishes, 67-year-old Spencer dies of heart failure. Catherine cannot bring herself to watch the film, but wins her second Oscar, 34 years after winning the first. After his death, Catherine diverts herself with work and is soon rewarded for it. A third Oscar comes along the following year in 1968. As usual, she doesn't accept it personally. She's scared she's going to lose. Let me do, give out, give up, give in. Give me a little peace. A little? Why so modest? 
How about eternal peace? Now there's a thought. Although she's remembered as a star from the 30s and 40s, her greatest success really came in the 1960s uh, in terms of recognition in the way of Oscar attention. Yes, a lot of good actors don't believe in awards, and they are silly. Who the hell is going to d describe exactly why person A was better than person B, C, D, and E in a given year? And if you were the best actor one year and aren't the next year, what happened to you? Did your talent go away? It's a ludicrous, self-promotional, cash-conscious, vulgar, boring event, the Oscars. But I love them. <laughs> I will think of good days gone, days to make a song of, crowning my sorrow by remembering we were kings and a king I married. Sons, I bore him many sons. <laughs> Killed her, Menelaus. At over 60, Catherine Hepburn still feels she wants to try something new. I was the stage manager of a musical called Coco that Miss Hepburn did on, on Broadway. So I know her uh, intimately, as they say. I can tell you a story about her. The first matinee that we did at the show, you could hear them building this building across the street. It's a 60-story skyscraper, and they were hammering and drilling. and. The, and Kate had this little lullaby at the beginning of the second act. And she called me into her dressing room and she said, listen, Jerry, go across the street, tell them that you'll signal them and that when you signal them, they'll stop work. So I go over the, and I get a hold of the head engineer at one of those huts out on the street. He thought I was from an insane asylum or something. And he said, before I throw you out, let me make sure you just... Anyway, he wouldn't allow it. So uh, I go back to Kate, she's sitting in her dressing room, and I said, they're not gonna do it. I mean, it's too expensive, so I'm gonna stop work. She, let me arrange it. Comes back about a half hour later, and she says, when you whistle, like that, they'll stop work on the building. And when the lullaby is over, they'll start work again. And they did it every matinee of the run of the show. I got out the stage door, whistled, and they stopped work on the building. I think it was like six months. Can you imagine what it cost the people who owned the building? <laughs> but that's the kind of woman she was. She, wa she used to bring cookies to the guys up in, up in the building. She was an extraordinary woman. And uh, she directed herself, mostly, I would say. I never heard her really giving any criticism uh, back to the director, but always accepted it, ingested it, worked on it. It was a great performance. She, she couldn't sing, but the audience loved the fact that she was trying. She drew a self-portrait of herself. And around this self-portrait, she wrote all the criticisms of the things that I do wrong as stage manager of the show, and then presented it to me. It says, Jerry, don't forget Kate. How could anybody forget Kate? Television is the new popular medium everyone is watching, but many big screen stars are suspicious of it. Even Catherine is skeptical at first. She's the only guest I ever had who came in a day or two before the show was to be taped to see what it would feel like, where she'd sit, where the audience was, how big the place was, and so on. And I was just dressed in a casual clothes and tennis shoes. And we were sat there on the set, and um, suddenly she said, why don't we just do it now? And I wasn't prepare, it was supposed to be two days later. But I thought, she's got a lot of guts, so why not, let's do it. Certain things have maintained themselves, my teeth are pretty good. <laughs> I can still hear, I can see pretty well. 
and I still seem to have a wild amount of energy. It shakes the boat a bit <laughs> once in a while, but I can still go on. In the 1980s, the Players Club, an exclusive club for actors in New York, decides to commission a limited edition print of a star, the sales of which would be used to sponsor the club's library. It would need to be a notable celebrity, and one name springs to everyone's mind, Kate Hepburn. I have to start. I have to do Anything you want to do. Ray Kinstler is an artist who has painted portraits of lots of stars and politicians. His friend, Players Club member James Cagney, gives him Kate's telephone number. Six months ago. I dialed the number. Hello? Miss Hepburn, this is Ray Kinstler. Oh, yes. Jim said you were going to call, and I will have nothing to do with appear. I don't appear, I don't accept honors, and I have no time for this whatever it is. She would ask a question, and before you could answer it, she was off this way. And I finally blurted out to her, I think, I said, Miss Hepburn, if I could only meet with you sometime and explain this. And she said, well, how about now? I got up to her house. She was sitting on the couch against the window. She was not as large as I expected, but still the bones were there, the delicacy, the voice was there, the personality was surely there. And I heard some footsteps coming from behind, from the upper floor. And it was her niece, Catherine Houghton. And I said, well, actually, what I'm doing with your aunt is she's going to pose for some paintings, which I'm going to turn into a lithograph, and we're going to sell these to raise money for the Players Club. And she said, looking at me, Miss Hepburn is behind me, she said, isn't that that all-male actors club? I heard every eggshell. Crack. I thought, this is over. And from behind me, Miss Hepburn's voice said, Catherine, to her niece, we're doing this to save the library, and Spencer was a member. And I did, in the course of several years, many paintings of her. She was very, very, very difficult. I said, Miss Hepburn, look, I can't tell you, meanwhile, her expression was like this. I can't tell you how much I admire you. I said, I've been very lucky in my career to have met some extraordinary people, but you're my favorite. You, as an actress and a performer and an artist, would appreciate what a fellow artist is trying to do, and I must tell you that you are driving me bananas. I can't work this way. You're this isn't right, that. I said, I'm just, ex I was like this, I'm exasperated. And she looked at me like that, and I, she said, she was holding her cane. She said, you know what your problem is? You talk too much. Why don't you paint a little more and talk less? That was like her. Even today, Catherine older stars are rarely cast in leading part. roles, but Catherine Hepburn manages to age with her characters. When Jane Fonda arrives with the script for On Golden Pond, Kate is more than thrilled. Jane has bought the film rights for herself and her father. Henry Fonda wins his only Oscar for the film and is the third leading man to win an Oscar on Catherine's side. Catherine is awarded her fourth and final Academy Award as Best Actress. She swam almost every day. She would even swim in the wintertime. She made the rest of us look like wimps. <laughs> She's over 70, and it's Catherine's last major role, where she seems to be playing herself, right down to the costumes and swimming. But darling, you're wrong about your dad. He does care. He cares deeply. You're my knight in shining armor. Dance, or would you rather just suck face? Miss Hepburn had, I don't know what the disease was that was crippling her, but it was a, it was a form of a shaking of her head and it became uncontrolled. She could feel it coming like a spasm. It was very disconcerting. 
And in the Golden Pond, I think there were vestiges of this beginning to happen. And at one point when Jane Fonda is complaining about Henry Fonda, her father in the movie, also her father in real life, Miss Hepburn drops her head on top of Jane Fonda's like this and says, bore, bore, bore. And I know she was getting a spasm attack right then. She was so intelligent about covering that up. She was so sensitive about it. At the beginning of the 1990s, she moves out of her New York house to live in Old Saybrook for good. She retires to Fenwick. Phyllis Wilburn, her secretary for decades, remains at her side. Clinging to my roots, Catherine says, is what saved me from Hollywood. In the peace and quiet of the New England coast, she's still working on herself. And in 1991, she publishes her autobiography entitled, in typically straightforward Hepburn style, Me, Stories of My Life. maintain that machine as well as I could possibly maintain it. And I tried, deliberately this was in the beginning, I said, don't get spoiled. Don't uh, dress up, don't get an expensive car, don't get a lot of fancy habits that you can't maintain if you flop, because the contrast then you're gonna have to carry. It's hard to separate Catherine Hepburn the way we saw her on stage and on film, and the Catherine Hepburn that we knew here on Main Street in Saybrook, because she was like anybody else in town. Old Saybrook commemorates their local star with the Catherine Hepburn Cultural Arts Center, or in short, the Kate. The converted old town hall has a small museum devoted to her, but Catherine would have probably preferred the live entertainment there. The phone rang one morning, and this is verbatim the conversation. Hello, this is Kate Hep. Oh, Miss Hepburn, how are you? Well, she said, I would like you to call me tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. So the next morning, I dialed her number. Miss Hepburn, yes, who is this? I said, it's Ray Kinsler. What do you want? I said, well, Miss Hepburn, you asked me to call you this morning at nine o'clock. It's exactly nine o'clock. You said, about what? Oh, I said, Miss Hepburn, I don't have a clue. Well, she said, neither do I, and she hung up. It's the last time I talked to her. Well, when Kate died, she was 96 years old. She was all used up. There was nothing left except this spark in her eye. She'd kind of look at you. But she was old, and it was time to go. And she went grudgingly, but she finally realized, well, I guess you got me beat on this one. <laughs> it's time to go. And off she went. Listen, we don't create the icons. The audience creates the icons. And I think that's so important to remember because Katharine Hepburn made hits and flops. We all make hits and flops, and we always hope it's gonna be fantastic, but it is a mystery and no one knows. Only a god would know what the true Katharine Hepburn was, and that's probably the way she liked it. I tend to feel that she discovered, tried out several, finally decided on a personality that she would play for the rest of her life. And it was a, such an entertaining one that I'm glad she settled on the one she did. I, I don't think anyone could say for sure, is there a more real Katharine Hepburn beneath, beneath all the Katharine Hepburn mannerisms, manners, gestures, voice, sense of humor, which is wonderful. Um, 
If there's a real Katherine Hepburn below all that, I don't give a damn. What we had was very good. I hate to say this, but uh, we've come to the end of the uh, time we have tonight. You and, mean uh, I'm finished? I can go. Well, I, I hate Thank to. Thank you very much. I, I've had a lovely time. Bye bye. <laughs> but I, can't you uh, wait till I say good night? No, you say good night. <laughs> good night. <laughs>